I'm forced to accept that at the fundamental quantum level, reality is truly unknowable. In the mid-1920s, an experiment was carried out at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey in America, which uncovered something entirely unexpected about electrons. Now, at the time, it was accepted without question that electrons were these tiny lumps of matter, small but solid particles like miniature billiard balls. In the experiment, they fired a beam of electrons at a crystal and watched how they scattered. Now, that's entirely equivalent to taking a beam of electrons, say, from an electron gun and firing it at a screen with two slits in it so that the electrons pass through the slits and hit another screen at the back. What the Bell scientists found shocked the physics world to the core. To understand why, consider a similar experiment with water waves. I've set up a simple experiment. I have a water ripple tank placed on top of an overhead projector. I have a generator producing waves that pass through two narrow gaps. The projector beams the image of the waves onto the back wall. You can see as the waves come in from the left and squeeze through the two gaps, they spread out on the other side and interfere with each other. What this means is that when you get the crest from one wave meeting the crest from another, they add up to make a higher wave. But when the crest from one meets a trough, they cancel out. This gives rise to these characteristic lines leading to the signature wave pattern. Bands of light and dark. Whenever you see these light and dark bands, the signature wave pattern, you know without doubt that you've got wave-like behavior. So guess what they saw in New Jersey? Now it seemed that firing electrons, tiny solid particles through the two gaps, produced exactly the same kind of pattern, bands of light and dark. First, light, for a long time believed to be a wave, was found to sometimes behave like particles. And now electrons, for a long time believed to be particles, were behaving like waves but it was actually stranger than that. The wave pattern wasn't merely some result of the entire beam of electrons. More recently, this experiment has been repeated in labs around the world by firing one electron at a time through the slits onto the screen. At first, each electron seems to land randomly on the screen but gradually a pattern forms, the signature wave pattern. Let me be quite clear about just how weird this is. Remember from the wave tank experiment where the signature wave pattern only exists because each wave passes through both slits and then its two pieces interfere with each other. But here, every individual electron, each single particle, is passing alone through the slits before it hits the screen. And yet, each single electron is still contributing to the signature wave pattern. Each electron has to be behaving like a wave. We can't describe what's traveling as a physical object. All we can talk about are the chances of where the electron might be. This wave of chance somehow travels through both slits, producing interference just like the water wave. Then, when it hits the screen, what was just the ghostly possibility of an electron mysteriously becomes real. It's hard to overstate just how crazy this is. Bohr was effectively claiming that one can never know where the electron actually is at all until you measure it. And it's not just that you don't know where the electron is. It's weirdly as though the electron itself is everywhere at once. Bear in mind that electrons are among the commonest and most basic building blocks of reality. 
And yet, here's Bohr saying that only by looking do we actually conjure their position into existence. It's like there's a curtain between us and the quantum world, and behind it, there is no solid reality, just the potential for reality. Things only become real when we pull back the curtain and look. It thus became apparent that the act of observation or measurement has a profound and inherently unpredictable impact upon the physical system itself. An undeniable fact which physicists could not explain. What then is the quantum enigma? It resides in the fact that there are no actual particles in the quantum world. That actual particles come into existence abruptly in the act of observation or measurement. So, what is there before measurement? Not a thing. But one thing is clear. Whether there are physical spooky connections, whether there are parallel universes, whether we bring reality into existence by looking, whatever the truth is, the weirdness of the quantum world won't go away. It'll rear its ugly head somewhere. One source of so-called quantum paradox was the so-called superposition principle. The fact, namely, that states of a physical system could be added, which means, for example, that a single particle could, in a sense, multi-locate, could be in any number of regions at once. Inasmuch as an observed or actual particle obviously does not thus multilocate, a radical discrepancy between the observed and the unobserved physical universe came into view. The senior quantum theorist, Niels Bohr, responded to the impasse by affirming soberly, there is no quantum reality, there is only a quantum description. What, however, rendered this position less than satisfying is the fact that it had by now become clear that there is no classical reality as well. The time-honored notion of atoms as indecomposable bits of matter had by now proved to be chimerical. The significance of this result is simply enormous. Just remember what it means. Einstein's version of reality cannot be true. No amount of clever jiggery-pokery with our experiment can cheat nature. The two entangled photons' properties couldn't have been set from the beginning, but are summoned into existence only when we measure them. Something strange is linking them across space, something we can't explain or even imagine other than by using mathematics. And weirder, photons do only become real when we observe them. In some strange sense, it really does suggest the moon doesn't exist when we're not looking. It truly defies common sense. The experiment only confirms this. Whatever is happening, we just don't understand it. But it doesn't mean we should stop looking. Niels Bohr's quote, there is no quantum world, there is only an abstract quantum physical description, says it all. At a quantum level the world does not exist. It comes into existence, only when observed. Beyond this, it is simply a wave of probability, of what could be generated, in a previously unobserved quantum area, on the basis of what is already generated everywhere else throughout the universe. Thus the universe preserves its fundamental law, that everything that is generated must exist in logical correspondence with everything else. This unreality at the quantum level, inevitably must also be applied to the universe at a larger scale. Hence the theory arises, that the moon does not exist, when it is not observed.
The most popular theory today, which attempts to make sense of all this, is the holographic universe theory. It states that the universe is somehow simulated, and an illusion. However, the theory is unable to answer fundamental questions, regarding the source of the simulation, and the principles of generation of this simulation. Science has been unable to come to a definitive conclusion on this for almost a century. There are two main reasons for their failure. The first one, is that the philosophical understanding of the experiment's results, was not required for technological advancement. Remember, after the war, physicists came back raring to go and try to apply uh, the uh, ideas of, of, of quantum theory to, uh, to, to atoms, the interaction between electrons and, and light and what have you. You didn't need to worry about the philosophical side of things uh, to make progress with that. So, as you say, it really took a back seat. Quantum mechanics led to a profound understanding of semiconductors, which helped create the modern electronic age. It produced lasers, revolutionizing communications, breathtaking new medical advances, and breakthroughs in nuclear power. Quantum mechanics was so successful that most working physicists deliberately chose to ignore Einstein's objections. It simply didn't matter to them because it worked. They even coined a phrase for it, shut up and calculate. And the price for this success was that Bohr and Einstein's debate on the reality of the quantum world was simply brushed under the carpet. The second reason for science is failure to understand the philosophical implications of the double slit experiment is that scientists only ever examined half of the evidence that was present. As Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. The physicists did what they always do. They examined the observation. But to fully understand the results of this particular experiment, requires something more than a theory, explaining the observed. It also must include a theory, explaining the observer. Since obviously the observer plays a major role, in the whole thing. The question that must be asked, is who, or rather, what, is the observer? How can the observer have anything to do, with the generation of material nature? If the experiment proves the unreality of the material world, what does it prove about the nature of the observer? A popular scientific explanation of consciousness today, is that it is an illusion generated by electrical impulses between neurons in the brain, and the effects of chemicals which are produced in the body, and absorbed by chemical receptors. For example, dopamine can make you feel good, and adrenaline can make you feel focused. Although it is obvious, that chemicals do play a major role, in shaping the prism through which you experience the world, they themselves cannot account for the creation of consciousness itself. After all, you are not the emotion that you are having. You are the one that is having the emotion. The explanation of electrical impulses, causing an illusory state of consciousness, is also factually unsupported. Electricity is a flow of electrons. Although today we have a very developed variety of techniques to do all kinds of different things with electrons, and achieve many different results by this, we do not have any scientific proof that they can cause consciousness. Furthermore, a purely philosophical examination of the double slit experiment should point out that both electrons and brain chemistry, which is of course fundamentally built of quantum particles, are both generated out of nothingness by the act of observation. They simply do not exist on their own without an observer. 
Therefore, to say that the observer can be caused by a dance of particles that are themselves caused, and come into existence by the act of observation, would be an illogical and self-contradictory statement, and a causal paradox. The double-slit experiment, simply forces us to examine the observer, as a non-material entity. Perhaps we could state, that the consciousness of this observer, is an illusory state which is indivisible from the illusory material world, that fills this consciousness. But we certainly cannot state, that the observer is an illusion. Actually, from a purely subjective perspective, the observer is the only thing that we know, and can say for certain, is a reality. But what would that mean? for our model of reality, to say that the observer is real, and the observed is an illusion, caused by the observer. Before we delve further into our examination of the observer, let us first set some foundations, regarding the observed. What is the fundamental structure of the universe? You might say it's atoms, but as we know atoms can break down to subatomic particles, and those can be further broken into even smaller particles. Philosophy presents the logic, that one can ask what the universe is made of. And once an answer is provided, the same question regarding structure, can be asked again. Thus we come to the conclusion, that a working answer, can only be one which does not allow a question, regarding its structure. The universe is made of that, about which it would be illogical to ask, what is that made of? As we know, breaking the atom and the subatomic particles, leads to the conclusion, that fundamentally, everything is built of waves. Also, light and all other forms of electromagnetism, are also a wave. But what are all these waves made of? The answer that most physicists would give you, is that the waves, are made of energy. However, this answer is problematic, because the definition of energy, is the amount of work that a force can do, for a certain period of time. The key word here being, amount. Energy is an amount, and an amount cannot really build anything physically. For example, a wave in the ocean contains energy, but is not made of it. It is made of water. Energy, is only something that exists on a piece of paper, in an equation, representing the amount for something. From a purely physical perspective, it does not exist. You may think you can see energy, in the form of lightning for example, but actually, what you are seeing, is atmospheric ionization, which sends a flash of light. Light, which is a wave in a medium. But what is the medium, in which this wave emanates? We can find a clue to the answer, by making a correlation with gravity. From Einstein's theory of relativity, we know, that gravity is a displacement force, caused by a density differential, in curved space-time. Space-time, has to stretch around matter, to contain it within itself. This stretching causes a lower density in space-time, where the density is lowest, at the point nearest to matter, and it gradually increases, to its unaffected state, as you go further out. Objects, within this field of stretched space, experience a displacement force, caused by this density differential. In this, we can imagine gravity, as a force produced by a standing wave. This wave occurs in the medium of space-time. So, could light also be a density fluctuation, in space-time? And what would it mean, if the atom is fundamentally made of waves, in space-time? The solution may seem strange, since we consider matter as something solid, and we consider empty space, as a vacuum and nothingness. However, this concept regarding space, as nothingness, is an illogical one. 
That is so, because space is the big black thing, which physically stands between the stars, and puts distance between them. If it was nothingness, then all the stars would be stuck together. So space is physical and real enough, to separate the stars, and also its curvature, is physical and real enough, to cause the displacement force, which is gravity. But how then, does space-time flux, cause the solidity of matter? The answer is, geometry. The energy, contained in the waves of space-time flux, get locked into a geometry, which causes the region of this geometry, to appear as something separate from the rest. A simple analogy, would be a tornado. The tornado appears as an object, separate from the rest, but that comes as a result of energy, locked in a geometry. In reality, the tornado is just curved air, that is in no way separate from the surrounding atmosphere. In the same way, an atom is simply a region of space-time, which is curved to act, as if it is separate. But it is not. So from this, we come to the conclusion, that the fundamental building block of the physical experienced universe, is space-time. Everything that is experienced, is an effect of space-time curvature. This solution also satisfies our philosophical conclusion, that the universe must be built out of that, about which it is illogical to ask a question, regarding its structure. You cannot ask, what makes up space and time. But where does all this leave us, in regards to the double slit experiment, and the nature of the observer? If the quantum world is fundamentally built of space-time, and quantum particles are space-time flux, and these same quantum particles, pop into existence by the act of observation, that would mean that space-time itself, is generated inside the observer, by the act of observation. This conclusion, gives us a clear understanding, of what the observer is. The observer, is a non-material, metaphysical, singularity, that contains space-time, and matter, as an informational illusion, in the senses, and the mind. In this paradigm, we are using the word singularity, as something which goes beyond the limitations and rules, of the rest of the system. The laws that apply, to the physical world, that is generated in the act of observation, do not apply to the observer himself. The world does not exist. The only thing that truly exists, is the observer. But how does the observer, cause the generation of the world in the senses? There is only one solution to this question. The observer is making a mistake. A false interpretation, of the observed. The observer is looking at nothingness, and falsely interpreting it, to be this infinity of experiences. The fundamental function of the observer, is imagining, dreaming, and pareidolia. Pareidolia, is the perception of a recognizable image, or meaningful pattern, where none exists. For example, all the images that you see on your screen, are actually just pixels. Pareidolia, is what causes you to make a false interpretation of these pixels, and see them as something more than that. The observer, by his awareness, opens a conduit of information flow. This information flow, is at first just random noise. The same random noise, that you see on your TV, when you don't have a signal. The same random noise you see when you look into darkness. The same random noise, that you feel, when your leg goes numb. This noise, is the foundation, of an uninterpreted observation. The observer peers into the noise, and because of lack of concentration, falls into a dream state. A false interpretation sets in, which makes the random noise, seem like patterns. 
These patterns make up the experience that is the world. This generation of the experience from nothingness happens on the basis of the principle of the division of zero into illusory opposites. Light and dark, hot and cold, good and evil. Matter and antimatter. Positive energy and negative energy. Everything is generated along with its opposite. Thus, the ultimate equation describing the nature of reality is zero equals infinity minus infinity. The nothingness divides into an infinity of opposing experiences. We live on the right side of this equation. But the left side is the actual reality. The world does not exist. The observer contains the illusion of time itself in the senses and causes and contains all the created time. Therefore, from this we can establish that he is unchanging. He does not have a beginning and a source. He does not have a cause, yet he is the fundamental cause of everything else. He does not have a conclusion. He cannot die. The experience is something which comes and goes. But the observer's existence is independent from the experience. You could make the point that without the observation, the existence of the observer is indistinguishable from non-existence. But indistinguishable from non-existence in no way means non-existence itself. A dream can only exist in a dreamer. But a dreamer does not require a dream for him to exist. Of course, when we equate the experience of the world to a dream, and the observer to a dreamer, a question quickly comes up. How can we all be having the same dream? The answer to this question lies simply in the fact that there is only one observer, not two or more. He contains space and time within himself. All division happens within this space and time, which is the scales of quantification, on which the experience is expressed. There can never be any actual division in the observer himself, since he is in a state of unchanging unquantized reality. The division between you and me is only a division in the experience, not a division in the one who is having the experience. The world is one dream, and it is occurring in one indivisible dreamer. And this dream is experienced through multiple points of contact, where the dream flows into the consciousness of the dreamer. This segmentation in the experience prevents the paradox of experiencing an infinity. An infinity, just like an absolute nothingness, cannot be experienced but a quantized, segmented infinity, presented into little bytes, all containing their specific quantities and qualities, goes around this paradox. There is just one limitless awareness, which contains an ocean of diverse sensations. Each sensation having its own unique qualities. One such sensation, has the illusory quality to block out all other sensations, thus creating an illusory state of separation. That sensation is the body. When you experience your body, you are unable to realize your experience of all else. Your body is just one sensation, in one unlimited awareness, which contains an infinity of sensations. But your body, is actually just as dead, as everything else. It is all made of dead matter. And in this, the experience, differs fundamentally from the experiencer, who is alive. So, all things that are experienced, anything from a supposedly living body, to a dead rock, have a sensation. They are, the sensation itself, and nothing more than that. 
and this sensation exists in the observer. And by the observer's experience of this sensation, the entire universe comes into being. And all of it is contained inside you. Always. All the stars and all the galaxies. All of the future and all the past. All lives and all dreams. You associate yourself with the experience that you are having, but this is an illusion. In reality, you are everyone and everything is inside you. Nothing can ever exist separate from you. This model of reality, which includes not only the observed, but also the observer, not only makes the results of the double slit experiment logical and obvious, but also gives us a solution to one more very big problem in modern physics. It is called the fine tuning problem. The physical world is generated on the basis of a set of laws. These laws include things like the value of the strength of the fundamental forces. Gravity has a certain strength, and that strength is proportionate to the other forces, like electromagnetism, and the strong force. The strong force is the force which counters the repulsion of positively charged protons in the nucleus of an atom. If the strong force were any weaker, it would not be able to hold the protons in place, and thus the atom would not exist as a stable unit. This value of this strong force, and its exact synchronization, with the value of the strength of gravity, allows for nuclear fusion to occur. And thus the stars are lit. If these fundamental forces, were even slightly offset, the universe would not be able to function. Atoms would not be able to form. Stars would not be able to burn. And certainly, there could never exist, this advanced mechanical machine, that is the body, through which the observer could make his observation. The result, would be an uninhabitable, unexperienceable universe. This perfect sink, of the universal forces, cannot arise from chaos, and is a mystery, if one is examining it from the perspective, of a real world, and an illusory observer. However, in the paradigm of a living, real observer, and an illusory observation, the perfect sink becomes not only plausible, but inevitable. A dream can only be dreamt, if it is dreamable. The world can only exist, if it can be perceived by the observer. The observer himself, on the other hand, can never be perceived, because he always stands behind the senses. The true essence of the living singularity, can never really be known, other than what can be determined about him, on the basis of the experience, which he chooses to create for himself. Just like a black hole, that can only be understood, by the starlight, that bends around it, All this however, is not a new concept. Actually, it is the oldest concept. It stands at the core of every religion. But it is most clearly explained, in the ancient Hinduism scriptures. The world in the senses, is seen as an illusion, called Maya. And that illusion, is generated by the living god, Vishnu. Vishnu, is described as infinite, birthless, and unchanging. Containing the universe inside himself. The physical universe, being his body. And his mind, is said to contain all minds. He generates the illusion of the world upon himself, and by the experience in the senses, creates a state in which, he divides himself from himself. And the ultimate goal of his divided self, is to go on a journey of awakening, and self-realization, from his illusory limited state, back into the unlimited state. This is achieved, 
by disassociating yourself from the experience that you are having. By disbelieving the authenticity of the world in the senses, and believing in the living one, who is everyone. By abstaining from physical stimulation, and by meditation. By quieting the mind, and turning the awareness inward. The foundation of all experience, is Nirvana. A state of supreme bliss. A golden light softness and warmth, and an incredible feeling of peace and complete emotional detachment. This state of bliss is covered by a series of filters which hide it and create the world as you experience it in your everyday life. When you feel any kind of pleasure, it is a small aperture that opens which gives you a glimpse into Nirvana. Detachment from the world the mind, and the body, removes all these filters, and the complete state of Nirvana is manifested. The universe, is like a painting with a double meaning. You see yourself as a mind, which is in a body, which is in the world. But that interpretation is wrong. Transcendence is achieved, by shifting your interpretation of the experience, and by the meditation on the true reality. That you are the living, indivisible, causeless, unchanging self, who contains the experience of everything and everyone, within himself, as a dream. Once the ego is destroyed, this transcendence, detaches the yogi, from happiness and sadness and from life and death. Thus the soul is liberated from samsara, the cycle of reincarnation. Illusion is dissolved, by an awakening into the true state. The following, are a few short excerpts, displaying this philosophy, from the ancient Hindu scriptures, in the Bhagavata Purana. The one pure self, that is enlightened and free, from material characteristics, constitutes the reservoir of all good qualities, that transcendental to the body and the mind, and pervading all, is the undivided witness, unrelated to the material world. Anyone who thus knows about the soul, that exists within this body, is, despite being situated within material nature, as a person, never affected by the basic qualities of nature. Such a one, is situated in me. He, who free from ulterior motives, always doing his duty, worships me, with faith and devotion, will discover that his mind, step by step finds the highest satisfaction. Free from the modes, the basic qualities of nature, and with an equal vision, he who, innerly free from contaminations, is of peace, will achieve the balance of my spirit of liberation. Any person who knows this changeless soul, as simply being the indifferent controller of the physical elements, the knowing and working senses and the mind, will find all fortune. They who are bound to me in friendship and enlightenment, will never become disturbed, by the happiness or distress, they see associated with the different basic qualities, and the constant change of the material body, consisting of the physical elements, the active senses, its intentions and the mind. Because of the pure love, one thus through devotion has developed towards Harry, the Supreme Lord, one's heart melts and therefrom one constantly experiences that one's hairs stand on end out of extreme joy, and that there is a flow of tears out of intense love. In that state, the mind, like a fish on a hook, gradually gives up. The moment the mind is situated in the liberated position, it immediately turns indifferent, and dies away with one's detachment from the sense objects. The person of such a mind, at that time, just like a flame, is no longer separated from the big fire of the super soul, 
and experiences oneness, in freedom from the interaction of the operating modes of nature. When he is situated in his ultimate glory, because of the cessation of the mind that responds to material impulses, he, on top of that, in his position of transcendence, above happiness and distress, sees that indeed, the cause of pleasure and pain, is found in the ignorance of falsely identifying oneself in ego. One is then, because of one's yoga, situated in self-absorption, the state of consciousness in which he, who awakened to his constitutional position, no longer gives priority to, or worships the body, with its sensuality and byproducts, that was born like in a dream. The way a mortal man, is understood as being different from his son and wealth, irrespective his natural inclination for them, so too a person in his original nature, differs from his body, senses, mind and such, irrespective his identification with them. It is like with a fire, that differs from its flames, sparks and smoke, although they, by nature, being produced by itself, were intimately associated with it. The elements, the senses, the mind and the primary nature, of the individual soul, the same way differs from the seer, who is the Supreme Lord, who is known, as the spiritual complete Brahman. The way one with an equal mind, sees all creatures as being part of the same natural order, one should also see the soul, as being present in all manifestations, and all manifestations in the soul. Just like the one fire manifests itself in different types of wood, so too the one spiritual soul, in its position in material nature, knows different births, under different natural conditions. When one thus, has conquered one's own, difficult to comprehend, bewildering, divine material energy, that is both cause and effect, one is situated in the position of self-realization. Difficult as it is, that will free the indwelling soul, given a steady practice, from the dirt of the emotions of lust. In the scriptures, is defended, that only the absence of attachment, to other matters, than the soul, in combination with an intense attachment, for the true self, which is transcendental to the modes of nature, constitutes the perfect conviction, for the salvation of man. That is realized, when one is a dutiful devotee, with faith and devotion, by means of discussion and inquiry, is spiritually united, in one's determination, and with respect for the Lord of Yoga, regularly attends and listens, to the stories of the God-fearing ones. Reluctant to associate, with the rich, and the ones who are after sense gratification, and not after the acquiring of goods, as approved by them, one gets rid of the bad taste of the happiness, that goes without drinking the nectar, of the qualities of the self, of the Supreme Personality. With non-violence, as a vegetarian, following in the footsteps of the teachers of example, by remembering the Lord of Liberation, by testifying of his activities, by the nectar of following according to the yoga principles, without a material motive, one thus, being without offenses, will be living a simple life, with tolerance for the worldly dualities. Within one's ear, constantly the discussions, in relation to the transcendental qualities, of the Lord, it may be so, that one, increasing in one's devotion and consciousness, is of an uncontaminated existence, in the material world, that is opposed to spiritual understanding, for when one has realized that kind of listening, it is easy to be attached, to the spirit of transcendence. When the person, in respect of the teacher of example, is fixed in attachment to the spiritual supreme, the impotence of the heart, 
as characterized by the five hindrances, ignorance, egoism, attachment, dislike, and death fear, that is situated within the covering, of the individual soul, that consists of the five elements, will be burned by the force of detachment and spiritual knowledge, like fuel being burned by fire. With that immolation of the inner weakness, being freed from all the associated material qualities, there is no difference, as there was in the past, between the inner action with the super soul, and the outer action of the self. For such a one, that difference, has ended just like a dream ends, when one wakes up. The person, sees of himself, both the objects of his senses, and his transcendence, as the witness. In that position, he knows desires, and designations, but without the two, not being innerly divided, that is not the case. The only reason, that one sees differences, between oneself, and something or someone else, is that there are different causes, for each position everywhere, just like one has with their reflection, that is different in water, and another medium, like a mirror. Because the mind is agitated by the senses, that are drawn towards the sense objects, the pure consciousness of one's intelligence, is easily lost, just like a lake that is overgrown with plants. Scholars of the soul state, that in the destructive choking of one's remembrance, the constant mindfulness of one's consciousness, is destroyed, and that the soul, bereft of real knowledge, thus degrades. In this world, there is nothing as bad, as the obstruction of that self-interest, in which other matters, seem to be so much more interesting, than the realization of one's own self, that one hinders. When one constantly thinks for the sake of riches and sensual pleasures, all the four virtues of human society, are destroyed. Therefrom, bereft of knowledge and devotional service, one lapses into the inertia of matter. They, who want to cross over the ocean quickly, should never cling to the slowness of matter, for that is the great stumbling block for the virtues of religiousness, economic development, regulation of pleasures, and salvation. In this respect, liberation is likely to be there, as the most important one, because engaged in the interest of the other three paths, one regularly finds oneself caught, in the finality of things, and in fear. For all those notions, of a higher or lower form of life, there will never be any peace, for they, depending upon the interaction of the material modes, are by the ordinance of the Lord, in the form of time, all destroyed. Be therefore, just as I am, persuaded of him, the Supreme Lord, who from within the heart, everywhere manifests, by dominating as the master of the field, radiating into every hair follicle, and who for all the moving or non-moving living beings, covered by a body, endowed with senses, and a life breath, is there for the consideration of self-realization. Surrender yourself unto him, the root cause, manifesting as the truth within the untruth. By this deliberate consideration, one is freed from the illusions of an intelligence, that wonders whether one deals, with a rope or a snake. Thus, one is situated, in the eternal liberation, of the uncontaminated, pure, truth, of the original nature, transcendental to all the impurities, of one's karmic fruitive activities. Be under him, Vasudeva, of devotion, like the devotees, who find him, whose lotus toes bring them joy, worthy to take shelter of. By devotional service, the hard knot, of karmic desire, is uprooted, but that is never so, with people missing that respect, however hard they try to stop the waves of sense enjoyment. 
in this material ocean. The hardship of the non-devotees is great with the sharks of the six senses. They cannot cross the ocean without much difficulties, and therefore you should make the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality a Godhead, your boat, for passing that unconquerable expanse. Prithu said, O Almighty One, how can a learned man ask from you, who are the master of all blessings, for benedictions, that are also available to all those embodied living beings, who are bewildered by the modes of nature, even when they are in hell. Nor do I ask, O Supreme One, for your enlightenment, to be one with you. I do not desire even that, O Master, because I then have to do without the nectar, delivered by the mouths of the devotees, at your lotus feet. Just give me a million ears, to relish that, what rises from the core of their hearts, the stories about you. Let that be my benediction. That soothing breeze, of the nectarian saffron particles of your lotus feet, O Lord, praised in the scriptures, as delivered by the mouths of the great ones, restores of those who strayed from the path of devotional service the remembrance of the forgotten truth, and makes other benedictions unnecessary. When someone, somehow or other, even only once, in association with those who are advanced, listens to the all-auspicious glorification of you, O honored one, how can someone appreciative of your characteristics, unless he is an animal, then, ever cease, with that, what the goddess of fortune in her desire, to hear about you, has accepted as your quality. Therefore, I shall engage in the service of you, the all-inclusive, supreme original personality, and reservoir of all transcendental qualities. Let there with me, who as anxious, as the goddess with the lotus in her hand, competes in relation, to the one master, be no quarrel between her and me, in the single-mindedness, of acting in respect of your feet. The mother of the universe, O ruler of the cosmic reality, being jealous might ruin my desire, to be of her action. But what difference would she make with you, who always favorably inclined to the poor, as a consequence of your benevolence, consider even the most insignificant service, very great. Saintly persons therefore, rather worship you, who dispel the misconceptions, produced by the modes of nature. O Supreme Lord, I cannot think of any other purpose, in the life of devotees, than the remembrance of your lotus feet. I consider that, what you said to me, with the words, make your choice, as a bewildering favor, relating to the material world. How is that supposed to work, when ordinary people, like me, who are not tied to what you say, in the Vedic literature, time and again, feel attracted to engage in karmic actions? O oh Lord, the people are divided about your illusory energy, because of which, they missing the real knowledge, desire everything but the true matters of the soul. Please bestow that, what you deem desirable, just like a father would do, for the welfare of his child. The Supreme Lord said, One cannot really say, that one is bound or liberated here, due to my modes to be in the grip of the natural qualities, or to be free from them, is not caused by my illusory energy. There is lamentation, bewilderment, happiness, distress, and the acceptance of a material body, because of illusion. Material life, repeating itself, is merely an idea of the soul, that is just as unreal as a dream. Knowledge and ignorance, are two forms of myself, 
that, created by my original potency, give rise to the liberation and bondage of the embodied beings. The bondage of the living entity that is part and parcel of my oneness is there since time immemorial because of ignorance and the opposite of liberation is there because of knowledge. Let me now dilate on the different characteristics of the opposing nature of being conditioned and being liberated, an opposition that is found in one and the same practice. Two birds of a similar nature and friends of each other one day make a nest in a tree. One of them eats from the fruits of the tree while the other does not eat, even though he is the strongest of the two. The one not eating the fruits of the tree is conscious and knows both himself and the other one, while the one that eats does not have a clue. The latter is always bound, while the one full of knowledge is eternally liberated. Although engaged in a body, an enlightened person does not abide by the body, like having risen from a dream. A foolish person abides by the body even though he is not engaged in the body, like seeing a dream. Someone not enlightened is invariably obliged to the false ego that thinks in accord with the senses that are directed by the gunas and the sense objects also generated. The ignorant soul who thus, by fate ordained, was caught here in this body because of his, by the gunas, generated karmic activities, thinks I am the doer. An intelligent person is not bound that way. Wherever he goes, he is detached with the qualities he experiences. Though being situated in the material world, he, turned away from its ruling powers, and assisted by the most expert, and in detachment sharpened vision, cuts with all doubts. Just as the sky, the sun, and the wind, do not attach themselves, he neither attaches to the separateness of things, the duality of the world, like he has awakened from a dream. The person whose functions of the life breath, senses, mind, and intelligence are free from desires, is liberated, despite being situated in a body that is ruled by the natural modes. When one, desirous of knowledge, thus gives up the misconception of a material diversity as existing separately of the soul, one should put an end to one's materialistic life and fix one's purified mind upon me, the all-pervading one.